All right, hi. So this video actually had a much different intended result. I, as you know, am Ben, Ben Jordan. Some of you may know me as the Flashball. I have been an FL Studio power user for upwards of 17 years. I've used FL Studio as my primary digital audio workstation throughout most of that time, and I've used it on everything from scoring films, hundreds of television shows and television ads, uh, dozens of albums, yada yada, brag, brag, brag. And fair warning, if you're an Ableton user, you might wanna take some Xanax or get a belt to bite down on because this is gonna get a wee bit frustrating. All right, so first a little bit of background. I've been using FL Studio on a professional level for about 15 to 17 years. And by professional, when I'm using that term, I'm meaning the television industry, the advertisement industry, the game composing industry, etc. In the first five years I was in that industry, I actually hid the fact that I was using it because most people considered it to not be a professional digital audio workstation. The television and ad music industry was extremely competitive at the time. And most of the agencies I worked with had multi million dollar recording studios and they probably didn't want their clients to know that somebody was using Fruity Loops in a bedroom to make music for their multi-million dollar ad campaign. But I worked with FL Studio for a reason and it was because I found those old school Pro Tools workflows to be cumbersome and inefficient. The reason I sound like I'm humble bragging right now is because I think that my weighted history of using this software actually adds value to this video. I don't really find the need to say this very often on this channel but I'm a professional musician and YouTube is still kind of a hobby of mine and it's a newer hobby of of mine. I've been a professional musician for a long time. Pretty much where I spend all of my time and everything that I've earned in my adult life is owed to my profession. And a huge chunk of my profession was spent in one piece of software. So I guess I take this piece of software very, very seriously. So before we dive in, the reason I'm telling you all of this is because if you heard that FL Studio or Ableton Live are not professional grade tools or that they're something that beginners would graduate from, you heard wrong. In 2020, they are used in virtually every fiber of the mainstream music industry. And yes, there certainly are other DAWs or digital audio workstations out there, but exploring them in one video with any degree of objective depth would be absolutely chaotic. I currently have updated copies of obviously FL Studio, Cubase, Reaper, and Bitwig, and I am very familiar with all of those. I haven't touched Studio One, Logic, Reason, or Pro Tools in quite a few years, but I do have a pretty good idea of what their strengths and weaknesses are. However, the one DAW that I've never really played with at all is Ableton Live. FL Studio and Ableton Live are, in my mind at least, the original anti-DAW, meaning that before they were commercially available, if you wanted to make music on a computer, you were typically using software that behaved like it was turning your computer into a digital recorder. So things like MIDI instruments or effect automation eventually came as additional features of the software rather than the core functionality. Now, FL Studio and Ableton Live, on the other hand, Early in their development, they didn't really seem to have any intention of becoming digital audio workstations. They were tools aimed at electronic musicians and electronic producers. I feel like if we're going to make a video that is comparing FL Studio and Ableton Live, we need to dive into the history a little bit so we could understand the fundamental differences in the software. Ableton Live was released in 2001 and it was not intended to be a digital audio workstation. It was intended to be an instrument or piece of software that would be used to perform electronic music live or DJ. Believe it or not, even today, most of Ableton Live's included synthesizer instruments were prototyped in Max MSP and then later coded in C++. So Ableton evolved as software that had a lot of emphasis on looping audio, looping MIDI clips, and pretty much having everything in one screen, making it ideal for live performances. I seem to remember a lot of electronic musicians using Ableton as a DAW before Ableton admitted that it was one, but it eventually drastically increased its capabilities, allowing you to write music, record music, and even master music. I would personally say that Ableton Live has a slow to moderate update frequency, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Although they were, I think, the last DAW to show up to the 64-bit party. I don't think they introduced 64-bit software until 2014. In comparison, Cubase had a full 64-bit build available in 2008. 32-bit software has a four gigabyte RAM limit. Now, this wasn't that big of a deal to most computer users, but when you're dealing with pro audio and big sample libraries, the memory management limitations become a pretty big problem. But this is history we're talking about. Ableton now runs smoothly at 64-bit and has been for five or six years. In 2020, 
Academy, without a doubt, Ableton is a powerful, fully featured professional music production suite that's used widely by professional musicians worldwide. FL Studio started out way back in 1997 as Fruity Loops, and Fruity Loops was a sampler that emulated the step sequencer style that you would find on some vintage drum machines. Fruity Loops was rapidly updated with all sorts of new features and quickly became kind of a favorite for bedroom producers. In comparison to something like Pro Tools or Cubase, the interface was really intuitive and easy to work with for new users. ImageLine is the company that made Fruity Loops and they eventually grew it into something called FL Studio, which is a full-fledged DAW. FL Studio was so successful at the time that it actually worked against them because so many people pirated the software that the company couldn't make a profit. This is actually really interesting to me because it kind of laid out the foundation for how ImageLine does business with its customers. Pro Tools fought piracy by requiring you to have proprietary hardware. Cubase fought piracy by requiring you to buy a USB dongle. FL Studio, on the other hand, fought piracy by making their software really reasonably priced and giving you free updates for life. While I think that this is by far the best strategy that a software company can use to deal with piracy. At the time, it was a bit of a double-edged sword. A decade ago, FL Studio had, in my opinion, an undeniably superior feature set in comparison to its competition in Pro Tools or Cubase, but it was still pigeonholed as software for amateurs. Interestingly enough, this is a perfect example of what economists call elasticity in demand. If product A costs 20% as much as product B, then most consumers will assume that it's only 20% as good. But ImageLine stuck to their principles, they played the long game, and it worked out very well. FL Studio is nearly a household name, and I would say that most artists the generation below me have not even considered using Cubase or Pro Tools or some, a lot of times even Logic. In contrast to Ableton Live, FL Studio's update frequency has always been very fast and ambitious. They went from being a simple little beat maker to a fully fledged DAW within a few years. And even with little subversion updates, you end up with some really crazy new features that are sometimes just way out in left field. If you spend an absurd amount of time learning and creating workflows, FL Studio virtually has everything you would ever want inside their signature suite. In reality, depending on your take and depending on what kind of musician you have, FL Studio could very easily be the most powerful digital audio workstation by a long shot, or it could be a kind of confusing workflow that is the result of throwing a lot of ideas at the wall to see if they stick. As somebody who has primarily used FL Studio as the brains for a wide variety of professional audio work, including my own that I like doing in my own spare time, I actually really like finding out those new workflows and experimenting with all of that power. However, I could easily see how it could be overwhelming for someone or how it could actually distract them from, I guess, making their idea into sound waves. And now here we are in 2020 and Ableton Live and FL Studio are competitors. And virtually anybody who wants to get into music production eventually asks the question, which is better, FL Studio or Ableton Live? And unfortunately, all too often, that question will be met with a tribalistic or disingenuine answer. If you thought that the PS4 versus Xbox people were bad or the Mac versus PC people People were bad, wait till you stick your head into this universe. And my viewers are included in this. I'm sure as I take on the steep warning curve of warning a new DAW, some Ableton user will be very frustrated watching me not glorify the process. So maybe before you crack your knuckles and call me a retard for not knowing a keyboard shortcut, think about the first time you used Ableton Live. Or better yet, go over to Mr. Bill's channel and watch how frustrated he is learning FL Studio. Learning a new DAW is never, ever going to go smoothly. This shit's hard. Actually, if you want to leave me a really mean comment, feel free. My wife reads them to me in a sarcastic voice. So as I explore, learn, and make a song in Ableton Live for the first time, I'm giving myself a set of rules. And number one is that I'm not using any third-party plugins. I'm only using the tools that Ableton gives me in the trial. Number two, I am not even opening Max for Live. I am here to learn Ableton, not a node-based programming language that works with it. Yes, Max for Live is a really awesome perk, and I've been using Max MSP for over a decade. However, patching my way out of getting to know Ableton's interface is not going to make this video very helpful. Number three, I am not using Ableton on my primary audio workstation. I have thousands of plugins installed on it, and I have a very complex routing setup that adds a lot of variables that a new user wouldn't encounter. Instead, I'll be using my video editing machine, which has a pretty fresh install of Windows 10. It has an AMD Threadripper 3960X and 64 gigs of RAM. The audio interface I'll be using is just a Presonus 1810 USB, 
The MIDI controller I'll be using is an Arturia Keylab 61 Make 2. So other than the video editing specs, there's nothing really extravagant or outside of the normal budget that you would encounter when diving into the world of music production. Number four, and finally, to drastically speed up my learning process, the videos that you're about to see are actually either private or public streams. Both my viewers and Mr. Bill were a huge help in getting me from not even knowing my way around Ableton's interface to being able to create a track within three days. This is probably cheating as I would have had to spend a lot of time Googling this information, but I wanted to learn as much as I could in the time that I had to make this video. Spoiler alert, if you are an Ableton user, this might actually be a little frustrating to watch. I definitely feel like my experience had a bit of a bell curve. I spent an absurd amount of time inside 72 hours learning Ableton Live, and admittedly, I was discouraged and grumpy in the beginning of that. And probably at points on the stream, I was just looking for bugs or UI issues just to justify my own ignorance. But by the third day, I could see the light at the end of the tunnel, and I was feeling pretty confident, motivated, and inspired. So bear with me. All right, let's do this. I am using the trial, which apparently I can use for 90 days with all the features I'm able to save and do all that stuff have max for live um, All right, let's try it out then when I say that my expectations with Ableton are a loop based non-musical DAW I realize that I'm starting the reason I'm doing this video is to find out where I'm wrong in that and a lot of people get very very territorial when it comes to their DAWs of choice and I, I kind of want to avoid that like, the reason I'm trying this is to prove myself wrong in a way. I mean, it's for a video project, but the reason I'm doing it is so I could know what Ableton's all about and what its pros and cons are. I got until uh, August 22nd to use Ableton for free. Yeah, of course I want all this stuff. Can't I just... I guess I have to authorize it. All right. Okay, I'll authorize analog. Also, I'm using this on a computer that doesn't have really any VST plugins. I, this isn't my audio computer. It's a very capable machine. It's running a ACO sound card and stuff like that, but I didn't... I, I knew that if I installed it on a computer with 100,000 VST plugins, I would end up running into some issues, so... I'm just using an Arturia Keylab Make 1 or Make 2 Keylab. Yeah, I, okay, I see the MIDI meter. Ding, 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 ding. MIDI meter. MIDI meter. That's odd. I don't know what this is. Right? Okay, so I guess I'm just going to load a new session and start from scratch. Okay, this is sort of what I remember seeing this little interface here. So uh, these are all my instruments. Um, piano and keys. Wurlitzer. Sounds nice. I feel like it's possible that this little Wurlitzer here that I'm using doesn't have, it doesn't actually change with how hard I'm hitting it. Oh, it is. Okay, it was just that preset. Good. That's good. All right, so I guess, uh, let me, if I'm to record this, I'm just basically goofing off right now and trying to figure out. Oh, I see. There's a little explanation down there that helps. Metronome. Got it. Yeah. Do we get a count in? Not really. Okay. So now I know that that records. And then I bet I could double click this and get a piano roll. Yeah, nice. That works. So we can move the... Oops. Control A, select. And if I wanted to change this to, let's say, a major. Okay, so initially, one thing I don't like right off the bat is that I can't preview the sound that I'm playing when moving this note. And I don't know if that's something I can actually... This is also tiny. Man, I have like 20-20 vision. I mean, I'm sure I can make it bigger. I'm trying to make it bigger, but this is like infuriatingly this keyboard on the side. I do see that there is a... Uh, 
there's going to be like some negativity obviously coming from me with this. I mean, I'm, I'm just basically like using my theory brain without being able to hear these previews. Oh, can you even hear it doing this? Headphones button. Oh God. Okay. Got it. Oh, perfect. Great. So if I, oh, okay, cool. Is there a way that I could look at this and then put a baseline below it is the next question. I see, I should just use this really, shouldn't I? Aha. Got it. <laughs> this has to be so frustrating for somebody who uses like anybody who's a live user watching this has to be so incredibly frustrated. Also, I know you guys are like telling me what to do on the side and I'm like trying to, uh, trying to like pay attention to this and that at the same time. And I'm getting too distracted by this. So this is just basically how to infuriate yourself for an afternoon. Just so you know, when I make music in FL studio or something like that, I typically have one pattern that has all of my instruments and automation in it. And so this is obviously going to be very foreign to me because I, I don't like using clips. I don't like looping things. I like having something different every single time. Whatever. A uh, new MIDI track. Oh, I guess I don't really have to do that, do I? I think I could just sort of drag one from over here, a drum rack. I gotta have drums somewhere. Oh, I see. Drums. It's its own thing. How crazy. Oh, so this is like a totally different, it looks like we have different like workflow for rhythm. It's, well, so FL Studio, it's basically like the same piano roll. <laughs> Sounds like somebody eating a chip. Oh, on red button on top of the arrangement. Oh dear God, there's a spider right here. Hang on a second. I got an emergency. I got a massive wolf spider just on my MIDI controller. Fuck, fuck off. Ah! <laughs> I'm not one of those people that's like, eek about spiders, but if you've ever been bit by a wolf spider, oh, that's not fun. Those things hurt. A button gets rid of the spider. Draw mode. Okay, so apparently I could press B and get into draw mode. What, why, why does B equals to draw? B is for, this is how I remember things in like DaVinci Resolve and stuff. B is for brush. Makes sense. As if we could make this track any more shit. That just did somehow. I didn't think it'd be possible. Okay, hang on. I'm gonna grab a guitar. I, I want a really long count in. I want an obnoxious count in. Four bar count in. Oh, what else? How about it? A wooden count in? I want a wooden count in. All right, here we go. All right, boys, let's hit this. All right, we're going. That was clearly not in time, right? We can all agree with that. That was clearly pretty bad. I have a broken hand. I get, I get like one little, I might get a free, I might get a free pass on that. But what I want to try and do is I, I hear that Ableton's really good at uh, slicing stuff up and like audio quantizing and stuff. So let's try that. I don't really know. Quantize. Look at that. Quantize. What the fuck? Did this just actually quantize audio that fast? That's incredible. Holy shit. Oh, Jesus Christ. Give me a break. Come on. <laughs> I'm like... I actually don't have to play bass all that well, do I? Wow. I'm absolutely amazed that that was so easy. Does Ableton have pitch correction? Does it have that? Could I like sing over this as well? Any sort of like pitch. I know um, FL Studio has like Vocodex and it has new tone and it has pitcher. Ow! 
It's hard to really know if you're in tune when you're using a fretless. I'm sure fretless users agree with me on that. Um, all right, I'm gonna use the tap tempo. I'm just gonna record for a bit and see where it takes me. God, it's so slow. I wonder if I could, maybe I'll play better if I take my stupid cast off. This is so dumb. Don't do this at home, anybody. Okay. So can I split it there? Yes. Got it. Split it. Got it. Delete this. Beep. Delete this. Beep. Okay. Am I getting this? Obviously my, what I recorded is not exactly five bars. It's just under, and I plan to keep it that way. So if I wanted to quantize this, you know what? I feel like I'm figuring this out pretty well. I'm just trying to figure out where I would like put in a new slice. There's some areas where it seems to just be off or missing it by a little bit, but it's still phenomenally good for just an auto warp thing. I'm, I'm impressed with that. That was very cool. To insert warp marker. I feel like I'm going blind in my review of Ableton. I feel like I'm going blind. Hope I didn't fuck everything up. Oh dear, that's the whole thing. Oh, I thought that I deleted that stuff, sorry. <laughs> what happened here though? What did it do to this? It thinks it's 400 and some odd BPM. Oh dear, what did I do? Cancel, don't do that. Hmm. Yeah, okay, so if I want to apply grooves. I could extract grooves too. I don't know if I want to. Do I want to apply grooves? I mean, I think I think we have a pretty good groove here. So I'm assuming that I can copy this and I could go up here and then paste it. Nope, I'm wrong when I assume that. I'm sure there's probably an easier way to do this, but I don't do things the easy way. I do things the Kurt Russell way. And I don't know, for some reason, I just imagine Kurt Russell doing things the hard way. Oh, that's weird how it kind of ghosts it. Not not necessarily a bad thing, I'm just not used to it to any degree. So if I just keep hitting paste, no, I can't. All right. I was hoping that I could just keep hitting paste and it would just... Uh, I guess that could be useful. I kind of wish I had that in video editing, to be honest. I'm just going to keep doing this until we round out to the end of an actual bar. It's so funny how bad I am at just clicking and doing anything in this program. Which is, again, I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying that that's because I'm not used to it. Oh no, <laughs> I did all that pasting in it. It only edited this one, God damn it! All right, this is the one that sounds good from what I understand. So you say if I drag it, it'll loop. That's kind of cool. Let's see if let's see if you're lying. Uh, yeah, well, I'm just gonna drag it all the way. Let's just drag it 16. Hey, maybe if I paste it after I drag it, it'll loop. Interesting. I'm not sure exactly what happened there. I'm just gonna make sure I'm copying the right thing so I don't go through this all again. Okay, then I am dragging it just really far, man, all the way to here. I don't know. Oh, okay, I see. So if I, oh, hold on. I thought loop was enabled up here. Control D. Oh, nice. Okay, it's okay. Sometimes you gotta put the work in. Imagine learning this without 140 people watching. Um, you guys are like, um, each one of these things where I've just looked at my screen and had somebody be like, no idiot, do this, um, would have been like a Google search and then watching like a video and it would have just been terrible. The downside to that was that this is not my finest moment learning a new DAW, like literally the worst thing I could do, <laughs> the dumbest I could possibly look. I'm, I'm looking right now. So that's the downside. Save live set as a... I don't want to save it to my desktop, you freak. Why would I do that? Desktop's just full of live sessions. First song in all caps. I'm going to add some sort of rhythm to it. 
I don't want to use samples. Well, I guess I have to use samples. I don't want to use loops. But I had some sort of kit, some sort of downloadable kit or something like that. Glitch and wash. What the hell is that? I don't mean to be a negative Nancy here, but I feel like anything that has the word glitch in it is like not interesting to me. <laughs> Session Drum Studio is probably the closest thing that I want. Normally I would I have a back there, I have an electronic drum kit that I would hook up, but I'm probably not gonna go through all that in my first demo of a DAW. Why do I hate this so much? There's something weird going on with the audio. I don't, I don't think it's actually Ableton. It might be like the way I'm monitoring it. I don't know how many times I go through these. I guess multi-rod draw is the one I'll use. Why do I see so many different samples here? I guess I'm just looking at the sample zones that are not, okay, they're probably not lighting up. That's probably what's happening. Okay, I see now. That's just a little confusing at first. I didn't really understand what was happening. Yeah, I want to make a new pattern and I don't want to play, just press record and play with my fingers. And in 30 seconds, I'll have an answer. Double click anywhere or select and control M. Aha, got it. Double click anywhere. I don't know why I didn't try that. That was kind of dumb of me. Sorry. I remember B being draw mode. Okay. And I remember clicking the headphones. Okay, yeah, so this is where I am utterly confused with Ableton. This is where my, my problems come in. In FL Studio, when I make a session, I typically, when I make a song, or when I have a session, I typically have one pattern. And for those of you who are familiar with like how song mode and pattern works, I typically have one pattern that goes the entire way. It has all the notes, all the automation in it. I don't loop anything ever unless it's just something really minor, like, you know, a little background symbol or something like that. Um... And I, and it, it looks insane. Like it looks completely, mo when people see it, like whenever I show somebody like a screen grab or whenever somebody looks at one of my sessions, they're like, holy shit, why would you do it that way? And that's just the way I've always done it. That's how my music sounds the way it sounds, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and so when this is like looping, when there's some sort of dis difference between what's happening down here and what's happening up here, I'm utterly confused, right? If that makes any sense. Like, the fact that this, hold on, let me zoom out so I know what I, so I'm actually, f like, 100% confident with what I'm saying when I'm saying it. Um, okay, so, see how I do this, and then see how I keep going, and it's not mirrored on the bottom. That's fucking my head up. <laughs> Big time. I don't like that. Um... It just makes me lose track of what's going on. And when I want to be really specific with timing, because as you can see, I've already recorded something at an odd time that ends on the fourth bar, the fourth measure of the fourth bar. And so when I want to be really specific with my hits, because I'm going to end up like having to do some math in my head, all that's going to get screwed up, which is okay. This isn't a problem with Ableton as much as it's an incompatibility with my workflow, which probably is very different than most people's. No. Oh, electric keyboards. There we go. 2.6 gigs. Let's do it. Why is there a maximum of... Okay, why is that an issue? Hmm. I'm not too excited about that. Yeah. Why, why will it not load anything more than a gig from RAM? I have samples that I load that are above four gigs five gigs and i also don't have a cancel i just i guess that's cancel right hmm. it's a little bizarre yeah let me let me see if i can change that because this is if i can't change that that's actually a legitimate criticism that i'll have for this DAW. yeah because this machine this is a video editing machine it has 64 gigs of ram i should have absolutely no issue running anything i saw the allocation thing um that's just odd to me i just don't understand why that would be Whatever. I mean, it's not it's not the end of the world. I pro realistically, if I were to use this as my main DAW, I probably wouldn't be using this piano sound anyway. I would be, you know, if I were to use an electric piano thing, I'd rather be using Piano Tech or I'd be using some other thing. <laughs> Automatically loaded the suitcase piano over the drums. I'm gonna figure this out. I swear. No. Hold down Control. Nope. I just wondering if I could put this put this note in without having to click it again to make it longer and I know I can capture like you just want me to capture everything 
Yeah, I mean, I liked what I, I played, but I'm just I'm playing with piano roll. <laughs> it's like too growly. It's just mean. Uh, this one's a little better. Yeah, I'm holding down my foot pedal right now. Hmm. It like intermittently doesn't work. I'm having some issues with the way it's recording foot pedals, to be honest. There we go, hold pedal. Yay. Weird. Yeah, it doesn't record. It doesn't record it for me. Mr. Bill's going to disagree with me on this one, but I, I feel like this is one where FL has, like, in terms of, like, automation, drawing and stuff, FL has has the advantage big time. That being said, I think that it's, ex I think it's really weirdly hidden in FL. I think that it's a workflow that takes a bit of time. Let's try this. If this only ends up on the snare. Nope, doesn't end up anywhere, does it? I get this, but as somebody, okay, yeah, nice. I like having light overdrive on kicks. It makes them more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Choppy. Not like that. Much distortion. <laughs> I'm going to try as hard as I can to turn this into a track that I would be comfortable sharing and releasing, which which is a pretty high bar because I probably make 30 tracks for every 10 I release. After I'm done with all this, I, I think it's only fair that at some point I go back and show my workflow in FL Studio. I mean, this is the first time I've ever used this, so obviously I work much, much faster in FL Studio. So I'm on day two of Ableton here. This is not a stream. This is just me recording my session for a bit. And I replaced the bass uh, with a Ibanez six string fretted. So now rather than being on that C, it is a fifth higher on an F. And so it sounds like this. I've obviously messed around with some of the settings here. But... So as you can tell, I've been programming and recording some other things here, but uh, back to that green little bass clip here. So if I'm to press control D, and duplicate it, you know, sort of the way I was told. And let's just play it right from here. It doesn't play again. It's kind of odd. I'm going to start from the beginning of the song and you can see exactly how this is sort of misbehaving because this is the exact same clip, right? It's just being duplicated. My markers are okay. They're all ending on the fourth measure of the fourth bar, so it should know exactly how big the clip is. I just don't understand why this is happening. Now, um, if I move it to just start at the fifth bar, it will do it just fine, but can't start it from where I need it to start. I can only start it from the fifth bar, and I've been trying to find that setting for about 30 minutes and I'm kind of just losing it at this point. I've changed my time signature to 15 sixteenths. And I'm going to try this and see if this actually does it. Yeah, so even when the time signature is accurate with that clip, it still kind of geeks out on it. I don't know. In FL Studio, if I'm doing something that's all in three-fourths or something like that, then of course I'll change the time signature. But a lot of times I'm doing a couple patterns in three-fourths, a couple patterns in seven-eighths, a couple patterns in four-four, and then I kind of blend it all together. A lot of times I even change tempo, and I'll uh, in FL Studio, one thing that I'll do, for example, is I will create something at like a third of the tempo or a, I guess, 66.6 of the tempo. So I'm actually programming in triplets and it just has a way more interesting result. And so I like being open to do those things. So I don't even really like changing the time signature perfectly for each single clip because I don't know when I'm going to use that clip differently in the future, if that makes any sense. And I know that this isn't probably the normal use of a DAW, but it's just sort of a trick that I've had up my sleeve forever. 
so I guess I'll try just for the sake of seeing if it works making this entire project 15 sixteenths and then I'll duplicate it again and 45 minutes later after changing the project to 15 sixteenths after changing the clip to 15 sixteenths uh, still nothing however here's a, sort of a workaround I, I have that I'm not that happy about and the only reason it's really working for me is because I have so much echo and uh, reverb and stuff like that on this recording Okay, so if I zoom in really, really close, um, I'm trying to find the difference between these two files. If I zoom in really, really close, I've actually, hmm, can I even find it now? Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna zoom in really close and you can see that I've actually cut the waveform a little bit short. So it's like not actually, ugh, this is really hard to navigate to. <laughs> It's frustrating to say the least so if you see right there I don't think I could I don't, I'm not actually sure I could even zoom in more but if you see right there I had to cut this a little bit short and if I cut this a little bit short then it's not really noticeable again due to the amount of effects I have on it but that will get it to play over but now when I want to duplicate it uh, I fear that let me see if it'll actually duplicate properly or if I'm gonna have to keep doing this over and over again yeah, crap. I'm going to have to keep doing it over and over again. So I guess I'm just going to have to like duplicate it and manually do this. I wish there was a workaround for this. And this is something that I've Googled a lot. I've looked at the manual. I've spent a really long time trying to figure out what, what I'm missing. And I cannot sort it out, which is unfortunate. <laughs> All right, we're starting day three with Ableton, and I'm still working on this clunky old track. And I have a dead cat on my condenser um, because I'm having like this massive air conditioning meltdown at the house, and I'm just running my mini split 24/7 now just to make sure it doesn't get humid down here while the central AC is on the fritz. It's also brand new. Not gonna get into it. So first of all, right now I'm having a bug, another bug. Um, we've kind of figured out that this situation up here that was going on with these yesterday was a bug. I'm running into another bug right now. This one's really odd. I can't move knobs, really. I'm like clicking. can't really move them. I have a left-handed mouse. Maybe that has something to do with it. Obviously, if I right-click, I could like show the, have the right-click menu. But I can't move things. I can't drag this. I'm not sure what is going on. Um, I can type in the values on some of them. But yeah, so for this big, massive synth here, um, this is all you really get to work with. I could expand these. These are just effects, though. But I don't know. I'm not... I'm going to have a lot of trouble getting used to that. I like opening things up and, and seeing the entire unique interface of... I mean, a lot of presets have their own unique interface, depending on what kind of soft synth you're using. Um, as for these onboard ones... They're all just little nodes down here, or little pods down here that you just sort of use. And I thought for some reason that I was missing something and I could open it up into a much bigger window or that there would be a lot more detail, and there's not. It's just not there. So for what it's worth, I, I mean, I guess that's why Max for Live is so popular. But I'm kind of kind of running into a wall with that. It's It's not the most inspiring thing in the world. But I guess I could see how the portability of this, how you, I mean, I guess I could see how somebody could get used to it and it could actually work in their favor. But again, I guess even if you have something that's bigger, then you're, you're still using this. Oh, I can't drag though right now. That's the issue. Okay, I could drag that. I could drag that. But when I click here, I can't drag it across. So I, I'm just going to have to restart the software again and see what's going on with this clicking bug thing okay so a couple hours later we have this like pad that nope sorry all right so another little issue that i'm having that i hopefully get over 
is I sort of went into complex chord territory a little bit. Not really that much, but, and the reason I'm doing this is because this is kind of how I noodle in a normal session. I just sort of noodle around and then I find something I like. And sometimes it ends up being complex in the song. Sometimes it ends up not being, and I end up cutting that out. But, so we have this. Okay, so I was just trying, like, this isn't even probably something I'll keep in here. Definitely not after the workflow limitations that I sort of felt with this. Um, so I haven't been able to find, I don't know if this is possible. It might be, and I might just be missing some big thing. But, like, when I click this bass, this is just my uh, synth bass, right? I can't see exactly unless I zoom in up here, like there's no way to have like a ghost channel to show where the kicks are, because obviously I don't just have like a, you know, everything's not, my, my kicks are in odd places and my snares are in odd places. And I like lining things up like that. And then also, um, this is just something I played live and quantized. It's just making it a real, real big headache. Um, and then the fact that my entire session is in 15, 16th, uh, it just seems like nothing really wants to, I don't even know how to describe it. Okay. So here's another thing, right? I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be bitching. I don't want to be, I feel like I'm just, I'm kind of just having a bad Ableton day today. I'm going to keep, keep cracking at it for <laughs> probably about four more hours today. It's Monday, Memorial Day. Um, this is where I'm at right now. I'm in the second part of the track, and now we're getting into sort of the drill and bass, flash bulby style stuff, and I'll let you hear that really fast. Okay, and one, it, it just kind of goes on from there, and it's a, obviously a slow process. And to sort of give you an idea of exactly what's happening, I have a drum kit that is made out of a bunch of four operator FM synths, which is really nice. Really digging that. It's really powerful. I feel like once I get the automation down, it's going to be more powerful. Uh, I'm still a little bit lacking on the automation. I kind of wish that this little velocity window could be mapped to different things, and maybe it can, but... Uh, that's going to be my next search after I'm done programming and all the stuff. But that brings us to this crazy little beat I've programmed here in the piano roll, uh, painfully. But it would be painful in any program where you do this. It's a labor of love. However, I've discovered that there's sort of, I mean, there's obviously a resolution to uh, this DAW, but it's almost like a plank scale resolution. Like, it's so small that you almost wouldn't even notice, basically meaning that notes if i take this it doesn't really snap into anything it's just kind of loose which is really awesome because that gives me it should give me enough con control to get when uh, you, you can see what i'm doing here is i'm tuning it i'm tuning the glitches to my overall song right so that's pretty cool and i can keep doing that and i'll show you exactly how i'm doing that so, like, with that last note, with the, uh, I swear I'll get the hang of this one day, right? Okay, so, um, that's just my tom, right? So I'm going to take that, and I'm going to zoom, I have to zoom all the way in so it doesn't really snap to anything. So I can be absolutely precise, because if I'm off by so much as a... Ugh, so hard to I think my broken hand isn't helping this very much um if I'm off by the tiniest amount it ruins this whole effect like then it can't work anymore so we're gonna go this way and now I'm gonna stretch this to be I know that I could make two and do control j as well but I feel like this is just an easier way of showing you exactly what I'm doing okay and then I'm gonna zoom in even closer here to make sure that I'm exact 
on that size. So now this should... Mm, I feel like that's not exact. Okay. Does that look exact? That looks exact. Okay. So now I have this, and I'm going to move it over to the start of this beat over here, which is... Alright. Okay, and then I'm going to hit Control D. And it should be an octave lower than the one previous to it. So let's see. Yep. Okay. That's what I'm going to be doing for the remainder of this morning, is just trying to get in some more melodic glitches. Pretty cool. All right, so a mere, uh, like, three hours later, I've recorded, like, a minute worth of beats. And now what I'm actually doing, got a little bored with it, so now what I'm doing is I'm putting resonators on those beats and uh, automating every single resonator in key. So let's hear that really fast. <laughs> that's actually in um, so this one so the F is actually an F major so this third will now be automated up to a fourth and then the uh, seventh <laughs> will go from plus ten to a plus 11 and that will give it a proper seventh and the chord change will sound like this Yay! if I want to get really funky I could go 14 semitones up which would give me a ninth so we go from a seventh to a ninth cool yeah so there's a whole lot of work doing this it's not it's weird. It, I, I don't think it's in, as intuitive to me as FL Studio's automation is in this type of thing, but this is pretty good at the same time. Um, one thing that I really wish you could do, and if anybody from Ableton actually watches this video, uh, if I am to change these, like so, one thing that I'm running into, um, for example, if I were to change this up a semitone here, and then scroll across, okay, see how I lost that and it went up to 12? when I was trying to do 11, my overall point is if you ever use Photoshop, for example, and if you hold down something like Shift, you may actually have this in Ableton, I just cannot find it, but if you hold down something like Shift in Photoshop, you'll just draw a straight line. Um, that would be amazing. <laughs> if I could just draw a straight line where I want to draw a straight line, because I am using a mouse. And again, I got a got a broken paw here, so that's probably making things a little more difficult, so it might not be actually fair to complain about that. All right, back to work. Over here now, maybe this is the best corner to be in for this session. Maybe I should just be smaller, like a little coin down here. So I have been working for three days on this project here. This is my first Ableton Live song, and uh, I think I'm done. And to be completely, totally honest, I would have probably gone a little bit further in certain places if I wasn't trying a DAW for the first time, but also, um, there are i feel like the piano roll is a little punishing a little hard to um 
write material that's not looping or something like that. And that's, I'm kind of okay with that now. Like, I'm not okay with, you know, I wouldn't write like a piano album here, but now that I'm actually playing with instruments that are more melodic, such as pianos, um, I, I think I'm realizing that, you know, this m might not be the best DAW for that type of thing. But you'd also think that FL Studio isn't the best DAW for that type of thing, especially since like Cubase can be directly plugged into like a score editor. But however, FL Studio is great for that type of thing, for literally just instrumental music writing, like piano or writing a, well, I've written orchestral pieces in FL Studio. Anyway, but we're in Ableton. And, uh, you know, I'm a little limited in... You know, I just have like a little mastering plug-in on the top of this. I, I'm not really mastering anything. However, it does seem like it might be easier to master things in here than it is in FL Studio, just the way the mixer's set up. Uh, but I don't master anything in FL Studio. I just export the stems and master it elsewhere, like in Adobe Audition or something. And I think I would do the same here, but, you know, that's not a takeaway from Ableton. That's just because I'm not used to it. So uh, I've added as you can see some piano here uh the piano has like a random midi effect on it like i don't know i just wanted to see what that did to be honest i didn't really need it using a lot of uh a lot of impulse responses another thing that i want to, before i like leave ableton here another thing that i want to mention is that i was really nervous about the amount of resources that ableton was taking when i first started this session up when I only had three channels or something it was at times it was getting up to 30 percent and it was using like 40 percent GPU and I was like fuck I'm not gonna be able to actually get anywhere with this track like I'm gonna get up to like nine tracks and then I'm gonna be done however it never really seemed to get that much worse like it probably got maybe up to 40 percent tops with all this going on I have a lot of waste I'm not bouncing anything I don't like bouncing stuff I have two drum kits a bunch of different samplers uh fm synthesis i have one drum kit that's running eight different operators right so this is my session and i guess rather than just like playing it in this weird obs interface i will just play the actual song with like a music visualizer behind it or something and uh make my face really big i'm not wearing a shirt if i were on twitch right now i'd be banned <laughs>
All right, you ready for my takeaway? Here are the Ableton Pros, or the things that I really liked. Audio time correction and audio quantizing is something that Ableton started with, and it has matured wonderfully. It's instant, it's really powerful, and it makes me want to sample my modular, or it makes me want to just go around my house and sample different percussive instruments. Ableton is generally more straightforward from the get-go than FL Studio, in my opinion, and that's actually a hard conclusion to come to considering how comfy I am with FL Studio. In Ableton, there seems to not be nearly as much work when adding a new channel and routing it. And it's not that these things are hard work in FL Studio, but it does require some keystrokes or at least some learning on how the routing system works in FL Studio. To be fair, as of FL Studio 20.1, they added the functionality where if you open a new instrument and drag it into a track in the song window, it automatically routes it to the mixer channel and to the channel strip. And if you rename it in the song window, it automatically renames it everywhere else. So it has parity. That is a huge step in the right direction for FL Studio. However, I still had to watch a very short tutorial clip to know how it worked. Whereas in Ableton, I just sort of intuitively did it. With the overall routing and mixing being a bit more straightforward in Ableton, I would say that if I wanted to record a live instrument and had to choose between these two DAWs, I actually would probably pick Ableton Live simply because I had made some mistakes and it was very forgiving. But if my sole purpose of opening the program was to record an instrument or if I was recording multiple tracks, I wouldn't use either of these DAWs for that. I would either use my Allen and Heath console with an SSD hooked up to it or I would use a DAW like like Reaper, where the core functionality of the program is direct to disk recording. I wanna say that Ableton is more compatible with hardware and MIDI controllers, but that's technically untrue. FL Studio is the more compatible one, especially with this new MIDI scripting tool. However, compatibility and plug and play are two very different things. I would say that more stuff just works in an idiot proof way in Ableton, whereas with FL Studio, you're more likely to have to do a little bit of configuring to get something to work. I didn't even get into Max for Live and I'm very excited to. It's huge, it's an absolute game changer and it is honestly something that FL Studio needs to catch up on. And to their credit, they did try years back with SynthMaker and Flowstone, but it seems like their partners just didn't follow up on their side of the deal, I guess. Of course, in most DAWs, you could have something like Reactor running as a VST plugin, or you could even have Max MSP or Pure Data communicating with your DAW via MIDI, but that's still quite a long way from having it integrated the way Max for Live is integrated with Ableton. Max for Live is an outstanding idea, and it is extremely ambitious, and it seems to have pushed this DAW to the next level. So well done, Ableton. I don't really have any other DAWs, or I pushed myself to learn it within three days, so I don't have anything to compare it to but I do think that it's a pretty big feather in Ableton's cap that I was able to produce a track within three days. And I'm very interested to see how Mr. Bill did over on FL Studio side. This is totally personal preference, but when I'm using FL Studio, I need more than one monitor. In fact, when I've used it on a laptop, I have one of those little USB monitors that I could use as a second monitor. Here in my studio, I have two 4K monitors that I use with it. I have all of that space used up. In Ableton, I used it on one monitor and I was pretty much fine the entire time. The vast majority of FL Studio users likely use it on one monitor that is not 4K, but 1080p or something, and they don't seem to have any problem with it. So again, this is a very personal thing. However, Ableton made me feel like I would, might be a little bit more comfortable in a portable environment. As I mentioned earlier, when you first dive into a complex piece of software with a big learning curve, you're never gonna have fun on that first day. And so I'm sort of disregarding my initial complaints and this is more of a general takeaway of what I would like to see improved in Ableton. So here is my criticism. The biggest drawback to me is easily the piano roll gloves coming off here. If you are an FL Studio user, somebody who's comfortable with FL Studio and you're going into Ableton Live, the piano roll is going to be an absolute nightmare. There's no note slicing, no note chopping, no humanizing without using groove clips. There's no randomizing. There's no uh, pitch bending without opening up a different envelope window and doing it there. There's no perimeter locking. This is a pretty big deal to me because generally, Piano rolls are not known for being the most fun place to hang out when you're making music, but it's usually very necessary to spend a considerable amount of time in one. In my sessions, I would say I spend about two thirds of them in the piano roll programming. 
If you've seen any other reviews of FL Studio being compared to another DAW, then you've probably already heard a lot of praise for FL Studio's piano roll. It's very, very powerful. However, that does not mean that Ableton doesn't need to improve on this. They do. In my honest opinion, it's lagging behind Cubase and Reaper as well. And it doesn't have a step sequencer function. And that's sort of the crutch that I use when I hate a piano roll. For example, I have an FA08 music workstation and the piano roll is a pile of shit. However, it does have a step sequencer and so I could just sort of step sequence everything and then if I need to make any changes later, I can go back in the piano roll and just use it for that. When I'm making my own music, I like to fill every single pocket and I also like to be extremely dynamic. I don't like using loops. I like everything being different. And so I spend an enormous amount of time in the piano roll and for that reason, this is by far my biggest criticism of Ableton Live. And I promise it is constructive criticism and I mean it with love and I'm sure that the Ableton team knows that they're lagging behind in the piano roll department. And I would hope, and I really do hope, that the next version of Ableton has some improvements in that area. I am very excited to see that. Most of us use plugins these days, so this is gonna be irrelevant to a lot of people, but the included instruments that come with Ableton Live seem to lack a lot of depth in comparison to the included plugins that come with FL Studio. And I assume that some of this is intentional as Ableton seems to prioritize screen space and simplicity, whereas FL Studio will just pop open a new window. For example, the operator instrument is so well tucked in that I'm either grumbling about what I'm missing from an FM synth or I'm squinting trying to figure out what's going on. In contrast, FL Studio's Citrus has six operators, each with their own pages and envelopes. It has an entire mod matrix. It has effects like delay, reverb, chorus. It has independent articulators for those effects. There's multiple looping envelope editors for each operator. Uh, there's even a harmonic editor in case you want to make an additive synth by hand. This is kind of the story for all included instruments when compared to FL Studio. Ableton's instruments don't seem to give me enough power, whereas FL Studio's instruments give me too much power. It's kind of overwhelming at times. Of course, both of these things can be bad for productivity depending on what kind of user or musician you are. But I guess if I had to choose one over the other, I would probably choose too many options over not enough options. In Ableton Live, there are some very little things which can become a very big deal. For example, if I want to modulate a perimeter on a synth or a mixer or something like that with an LFO, I have to either make or find a Max for Live device to do it. Not that big of a deal, right? I modulate everything all over the place in my sessions and not being able to do that as much as I like in Ableton actually made me miss that freedom a whole lot. And it made me wonder that if I were an Ableton user that was trying out another DAW, I might not even know to look for that simply because it wasn't something that was always easily available to me. So it's just this little tiny thing that may actually change the character of how somebody's music sounds. Both FL Studio and Bitwig do something called sandboxing when they load a plugin. Basically, if you load a VST instrument or effect and it crashes, it crashes the VST instrument or effect, not your entire DAW. Ableton unfortunately doesn't support this. And while I'm not a professional developer, it seems like it would be something hard to write in in a future update since it has to do with the core functionality of the software. Ableton Suite doesn't seem to have anything for pitch correction. It doesn't even have an auto-tune effect, whereas FL Studio seems to have a whole buffet of options and some of them actually sound better than fully fledged pitch correction suites like Melodyne. This one is not that big of a deal, but it is so weird to me. Ableton does not use true panning, meaning that when you pan a track, you can raise it by as much as three decibels. And this made me think that I was losing my fucking mind when mixing my track. Once I finally figured out that it was using circular panning, I was like, okay, well, I must've screwed up a setting somewhere that somehow there's a little button I need to tick or something, but there wasn't. The only way to pan without increasing the volume is with a Max for Live device, which brings me to the next thing. This isn't a con or a criticism per se, it's more of a warning or something that I'm worried about. Whether intentional or not, I do feel as if Max for Live is sometimes used as a crutch for Ableton's shortcomings. For example, when I was doing my stream, I would ask if a certain feature or functionality exists and I would get a resounding yes, 
you can do it in Max for Live. I do not consider Max for Live to be part of the core functionality of Ableton Live for a few very valid reasons. First being it's not very user friendly to the average person who's just trying to make a song. It's also not the same language. Max, while extremely powerful and fun to work with, is a node based programming language, meaning that it's more likely to be unstable and clunky. So while Ableton and Max are nearly becoming synonymous, I do think that that some Ableton fans are having their cake while eating it, while praising the power and versatility of Max, while also praising the efficiency and stability of Ableton Live. It felt a bit like a friendly car salesman showing me a car, and I said, hey, is there a drink holder in the back seat? And he said, yes, there is. There is a box full of Legos and you can make a drink holder in the back seat. Well, no, there's not a drink holder in the back seat. There's a box of fucking Legos in the back seat. I would not even bother talking about this, much less go on this sort of tangent about it if I wasn't told to make a Max patch to pan a track. Again, I am so excited to dive in and play with Max for Live, but I still cannot consider it a band-aid for something that might be missing in the core functionality of a DAW. As with most of my videos, I don't really realize how ambitious most of my explorations are until I'm already on them. And I feel like I have to come to some sort of general conclusion here, especially if you've been watching all of this time. If you're the type of artist who might make long progressive dance tracks or even work on a lot of remixes, then I feel like Ableton has a pretty clear advantage for you. If you are a musician with a more melodic background or somebody who intends to make a lot of instrumental music, or maybe somebody who intends to make music with lots of dynamic changes or somebody who will be scoring to cues or film scoring, then I feel like FL Studio is probably the pretty clear choice. If you're an experimental musician, then I guess things could get even more complicated. Ableton has Max for Live, which means that with a pretty steep learning curve, you could be making your own sequencers, synths, etc. A lot of us think of node-based audio languages as infinite possibilities, but that's not really true. For example, FL Studio has Harmor, which is absolutely insane. It's a resynthesis engine and probably the most powerful additive synth to ever be made. You can't make that with Max MSP. You couldn't even get close. In FL Studio, you could, I don't know, for example, put a peak controller on a guitar track, have that peak controller uh, trigger an LFO that will trigger the overall BPM of your entire project. You could kind of connect anything to anything and it gets really crazy really fast. And if you're a musician on the experimental side of things, then you also need to give Bitwig a fair chance because their grid system is amazing. It's a virtual modular environment that's built into the DAW. But whether we're talking about beat making or film scoring or writing instrumental piano tracks or being an experimental musician, you can obviously do all of these things with either DAW. It's just a drastically different user interface to get you to your goal. If I were to think of an even broader way to describe my impression of the differences between these two DAWs. When first opening Ableton, it was very easy to get started. However, when I got more than a couple tracks, it felt more and more hectic. And by the time my song was over, I, I was having trouble finding certain things and I was just having trouble mixing it, especially with that panning issue. And it just felt more hectic and stressful and it kind of made me want to be done with the track quicker. Opposed to this, FL Studio actually feels a little overwhelming if I just want to make a really quick melody. However, if I have 40 different tracks and channels routing everywhere, I actually feel way more comfortable inside FL Studio and more confident of what I'm doing. In comparison to FL Studio, Ableton has a very controlled, guided, and somewhat minimal user interface. And you could tell that a lot of thought went into it. It's intentional. If you're ready to really dive in and learn Max MSP, then you'll get a very powerful and unique production experience. I don't think the track I made in Ableton is anything special, but I do think that it is a feather in Ableton's cap that I was able to make it in three days. Now, FL Studio, I feel like I can confidently say, at its core, FL Studio Signature Edition is currently the most powerful DAW in the world. But with great power comes clutter. If you need an incredibly powerful additive resampling engine, or if you need a massive filter bank, or if you need looping envelopes that are mapped to your mixer sends, all of that is available at your fingertips only one or two clicks away. However, if you don't need any of these things, all of that stuff is available at your fingertips only one or two clicks away. And for somebody who didn't age with a program like myself, I can understand how that might be a little overwhelming at first. Most importantly though, in the conclusion and takeaway that I hope most of you are getting from this video, 
audio is that when you listen to my track or when you listen to Mr. Bill's track, you understand that 90% of that came from experience. 10% came from the DAW we used. This is art we're talking about, and art is extremely subjective. There will likely, no, there definitely will never be an objective answer to which DAW is best. And if you're spending your time arguing about which DAW is best, then you should probably spend your time learning how to make music in general. Maybe the pricing will help you make a decision. As for cost, Ableton Live's full suite, the one that you witnessed me using, costs $749. FL Studio's signature bundle, which includes, I believe, every single thing that they make, costs $710. However, there is one important thing I need to note. FL Studio has free upgrades and updates for life, meaning that you will never pay them money again, yet you will always get new features and updates. However, Ableton, I believe their Live Suite 9 to Live Suite 10 upgrade costs $300. If I have to pick one, and it actually pains me to pick one because Ableton really did start growing on me and I have a feeling that it's gonna continue to grow on me. If I started making music in Ableton, I'd probably be an Ableton fanatic. So if I have to pick one for a new musician or somebody who wants to get into music production, even with Ableton's user interface that might be better for somebody who's new, ImageLine has the free updates forever and they also just have a long-standing good relationship with their customer base and I still can't pick one. The good news is both of these have trials, so you could try for yourself and you can make up your own mind. I'm really glad I did this for a few reasons. Ableton will not replace FL Studio as my primary DAW, but I'm excited to dive in and check it out from a more experimental approach that targets its strong points rather than just puts it at as a competitor with what I use to make music generally. I am actually really excited to look through the Max for Live library and see what's there, uh, maybe even make some of my own patches. I'm really excited to record my modular into Ableton and use some of the quantizing and grooves and stuff like that a lot more experimentally and creatively. Just as importantly, doing videos on this channel requires me to understand how the plugins and hardware that I'm reviewing will be implemented, and a lot of my viewers are Ableton users. I want to be able to participate in conversations about Ableton Live and at least have some idea of what I'm talking about, and I intend to continue to learn Ableton Live. If you like this video, if you learned anything, subscribe to the channel. Let me know in the comments if there's anything you want me to cover in the future. If you want to get super smart and support this channel at the same time, I am a partner with Curiosity Stream, a massive, massive library of documentaries that you could get for under $20 a year uh, with my referral code, which is down in the description. Okay, that's enough. Bye.